So, our text today is in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 9. Now, if you don't know anything about 2 Timothy or the last, the 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, um, specifically 2 Timothy, this is the last letter that Paul wrote uh, in, in during his lifetime. He is in prison, he is in Rome, he's not expecting to be released. And so we come to this letter with an aged, experienced apostle. He had been through so much in his life. Some commentators, uh, they say that probably he was in his late 60s in prison. So this is a man who had well-seasoned in life, in ministry. right? So there's a lot to, for us to learn from this uh, book. Um, I'm, I'm going through this book of the church in North Arlington. So in, in, in the first chapter, we see Paul encouraging Timothy. He starts this letter encouraging Timothy because he's suffering. Um, he's dealing with so much discouragement in his ministry in Ephesus. And Paul is encouraging him. He's, in some portions, you see how he is actually exhorting him. And he's encouraging. He, the first encouragement comes as he reminds Timothy how he was raised in the faith by his mother and grandmother. And he's saying, remember the good teaching that you learned from your mother and your grandmother. Therefore, strive for, push through uh, the challenges. Believe in Jesus Christ. Stand firm in our faith and for his gospel. Share in his sufferings as I'm sharing his sufferings. So this tone of a encouragement and exhortation for him to push forward. For him to, to fight as a good soldier, not to, not, not, not to skip or, or not to be afraid of the persecution and ongoing opposition, but to be faithful in preaching the gospel. And he reminds Timothy in chapter 2 to be a, a worker approved by God, to rightly teach the scriptures, to avoid irreverent babble. And and he goes on, and especially when you put the two books together, we see one repeated theme in this book, how he encouraged Timothy not to, um, not to get um, entangled with irreverent babble or quarreling, unnecessary quarreling, disputes about genealogies, things that do not promote godliness. In fact, he says in chapter 2, it promotes ungodliness. He said, he avoid this sort of, of, of discussions, vain discussions. So, and then we come to chapter 3. And this is what he says in chapter 3, verses 1. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, Disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses. So these men also oppose the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith, but it will not get very far. For their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. Let's ask for God's blessing. Heavenly Father, as we stand before your word, we ask the Holy Spirit may speak to us. Help me to preach the truth graciously with confidence in the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, for your help, for me, and for all of us, not only to understand this text, Lord, but to apply it to our hearts. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So I have two outlines to share with you that you have in your handout. The first one, difficult times. Difficult times. You see that in verse 1. But understand this, that, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. This is not the first time that Paul is telling Timothy this. That they were living in times of difficulty and the future would be difficult times. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1, Paul already warned Timothy that in the latter days, many would depart from faith. In our text today, we see that in the last days, there will be difficult times, apostasy. And because of the increase of godlessness, those things will actually increase. It's like a large deception, a, lar a large scale apostasy in the last days. Now, the last days here refers to the period from the first coming of Christ to his second appearance. So we are living in the last days. Paul was living in the last days. So that's the, the time frame that we are looking in uh, when we think about the last days. Now, since of the coming of Christ in the flesh, deception, apostasy, has been part of of the church history. The church has been dealing with these things over and over since the time of the apostles. We see it in this letter of First Timothy, uh, Second Timothy, First Timothy, Jesus warning his disciples about wolves in sheep's clothing. So the church has dealt with apostasy and deception. But with one caveat, that godlessness and deception will increase to a large scale before the return of Christ, before His appearance, His second um, coming. So the days of Paul and Timothy were difficult ones, as it is our time. And it will be more as time progresses. Remember when the disciples asked Jesus about the, sign, the signs of the end of the age and his coming? Remember what Jesus said to his disciples? Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 and 5. Jesus said to them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. A few verses later, verse 11 to 13. Matthew 24, Jesus continues and says this, And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. So what do we see in, this, in these verses? We see persecution. Large-scale deception, godlessness, lawlessness, and the love of many will grow cold in those times. Paul experienced, to some extent, all of these things, as we are experienced, in some measure, all these things. Now, just going back to our text in verse 8, it's very interesting. In verse 8, Paul, Paul compares the false teachers with Two figures in the Old Testament, Janus and Jambres. Now, these two men appear in Exodus chapter 7, verse 11. Their names actually do not appear in the book of Exodus, but appears here. And they are described as magicians who opposed Moses before Pharaoh, when Moses came with his brother Aaron before Pharaoh to ask Pharaoh to let the Israelites go and worship the Lord in the wilderness. Now, even though the, the name of these two men, Janus and Jambres, they do not appear in Exodus, and in Jewish tradition, they were well accepted as to be true, the, the name of these men. That's why, that's why Paul is quoting here, and this name would not be unfamiliar to Timothy and to the first century Jew. Now, but it's interesting that when you read Exodus chapter 7, verse 11, they're called magicians, right? Especially in the ESV, they're called magicians who oppose uh, Moses. And 
And I think our minds in the 21st century, they try to make this connection with magicians in the Old Testament or, or over 2,000 years ago with magicians in our days. And in fact, when, when I came to us 14 years ago, I just realized how, um, how Americans, they have this, um, this respect for magicians, how magicians is actually a, 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 a profession in the U.S. There are agencies that hire magicians, and you, you, can, um, you can hire them to bring to your home and for children's birthday party and so on and so on. And, um, and just to, for you to have an idea how magicians, in the, I will explain the difference between magicians in the first century and the second century. But there are some similarities that I want to point it out. So five years ago, a magician called uh, Liang Shanlin, known professionally, professionally as Shin Lim, was the first magician to win the America's Got Talent. And uh, my wife and I, we watched that. It was the um, Champions Edition. And he was very good. You know, his trickery and, and, and things that he does with his hands. Very, very good. You, you're just impressed of, of what he's doing. So he's an er, enter, entertainer. And he's performing all this trickery before you. And you say, what, what's actually happening here? Right? You know that you are being tricked. And somehow, but you don't see how he's doing that. Very, very good with his, his light of hand and, 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 and his persona and, and this and that. Very convincing. And actually, he, he, on his own, he has his own show in Las Vegas. So this is what I want to show you, that magicians are known for skillfully performing tricks of illusion. This light of hand. But in the first century, Magicians were not mere entertainers, but people involved in sorcery, astrology, divination, witchcraft, and various occult arts. So there's a big difference between what we understand of magicians in the first century to magicians, or before the first century, uh, to magicians in our days. So, but what Paul is trying to show here is that these false teachers in Ephesus are nothing more than magicians who make their living by skillfully performing trickery acts. He's trying to make this point that this, this false teachers in Ephesus, he's comparing them to these magicians in, in, in times of Moses to show that they make their living by performing these trickery acts. When we think about what these false teachers they were doing in Ephesus and what these magicians in the time of Moses they, they did, we can clearly see that these men, they were not only uh, skillfully in performing magic, but they were empowered by Satan mm -hmm. to, to, to say and do what they did. Deceiving people. Now, in the Old Testament, James and Jambres, they deceived Pharaoh twice by replicating the first two signs um, that Moses did before Pharaoh. Now, if you remember the first two signs that Moses performed, the first one, he turned the, the water of the Nile in blood, and the second one, the, the frogs that came from the Nile. And, and by their trickery, these magicians, Janus and Jembrus, they were able to perform those two, to replicate those two signs. And even before that, when, when Moses first came before Pharaoh, and he threw his staff, and his staff became a serpent, the magicians also threw their staff, but then Moses' staff that became a serpent swallowed up their uh, serpents, the staff that became serpents. So in actually like three uh, signs they were able to, able to replicate before Pharaoh. So what Paul is saying is that the activity of this, the, the, the false teachers is similar to, to that of Janus and Jambres. The difference, like I said, between both is that Moses and Aaron, they were servants of God, empowered by divine 
power nor by the occult power of the devil. So in the end, in the end, these magicians in the Old Testament, when it came to the third sign, they could not replicate the sign anymore. And they had to recognize, and as, as you read Exodus chapter 8, they said before Pharaoh, what they are doing is by the finger of God. So they had to recognize that what Moses and Aaron, they were doing, it was not by any sort of what they knew about power, but a, a much more, a, a higher power. And they had to recognize, they recognized that before Pharaoh. But in this text, we see also Paul talk, talking about um, the false teachers, their speech. And Paul tells Timon that they have already made disciples among the women in Ephesus. Paul describes them as weak women, loaded down with sins, who despite receiving the right teaching, seem never to make much progress in the application of the gospel to their lives. The point, he, the, the, the point here is that despite being being in the church for a period of time, some of the women are still burdened with sin, sinful desires. They have been taught over and over and over again, and yet their sins and all kind of evil desires made them an easy prey for these false teachers. Some of the women lend their ears and give their, gave their attention to these false teachers. Others opened their houses to these professional magicians to mislead others, and they found a platform among the women in Ephesus. And as a result, many women in Ephesus believed in their deception and were spreading their deception, the false teachers' deception. And Paul calls these women silly women for departing from truth to believe in lies. Now before you think that Paul is picking on women here, he's just acknowledging something that is happening in Ephesus and he's addressing this straightforward. He's addressing this straightforward. So we must be reminded that not only women are susceptible to deception, but men as well. In verse 5, Paul explicitly tells Timothy to stay away and have nothing to do with the deceivers. Why? Because those who are standing must be careful not to fall, whether they are men or women. Those who are in the gospel must make sure that they, are keeping their, they keep themselves in the light of the gospel. So men are also easily deceived, can be easily deceived as we depart from the truth. As we depart from the truth, we can be easily deceived. So Paul's acknowledged there's an issue here. The women are being deceived. They found, the false teachers found a platform. They are preying on these women. They're, they're spreading their false teaching, and it became an issue. And Paul is writing to Timothy to address this issue. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 to 26, Paul tells Timothy to be gentle with, with his opponents, hoping that God may, may grant them repentance. Now, I find it interesting because in this chapter 3, Paul is telling Timothy, in regards of the, the, the false teachers, he, compare, he compares them with these magicians in the, in, in the times of Moses. And then he tells Timothy, stay away from them. Do not even get close. Stay away. But in, in the chapter before, he's telling Timothy, in regards of his opponents, to be gentle with them, so that God, in the hope that God may grant them repentance. So it seems to me that Paul is talking about two groups of people here. The one that has been deceived by the false teachers in chapter 2, 
And Paul is telling them these opponents, these perhaps these women who have believed in, in, in the lies of the false teachers and men, you, 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 you speak to them with gentleness and you pray for them, hoping that they may come to their sense and escape of the snare of the devil. And in this chapter, Paul is telling the Timothy, he's addressing the specific the false teachers, the wolves in sheep's clothing, and he's saying, those, you stay away. Those, you stay away. It doesn't mean we're not going to pray for them, but stay away. It is dangerous. They, are, they, have found, they found a platform among the women. They are praying on them. They are spreading their false teaching. You stay away. As the leader of the church, you stay away from these false teachers. You see, two groups of people Paul is addressing here. Now, and the question that comes to our minds is, how do we identify false teachers? How do we identify false teachers? Again, going back to Matthew chapter 7, verse 16, Jesus tells us that we can recognize false teachers by their fruit by their lifestyle, by their fruits of behavior, how they live their life, their character. In other words, those who, who, who live their, those who present themselves as, as, as preachers, as gospel-centered people, and they preach wonderful sermons from the pulpit, but live a different life away from the poop, away from the church. Those are false teachers. Because if the gospel is something that we just preach and tell others to do when we don't apply it to ourselves, there's something wrong with, with us. There's someone with the one who preached that gospel to others and do not believe in them. But more than that, they were teaching these false teachers. They were teaching a different gospel. They were adding. They were they were they were they were putting things in the message of Christ that were not there. So we can recognize false teachers and how their fruits, we can recognize them by their doctrine, how they preach, if they preach and they're faithful to preach in the gospel. So we identify the fruits doctrinally and if they're, sti sti if they're sticking to the gospel. And to the last one, it seems that Paul holds fast very strongly. And he keeps repeating it. If they depart from truth, if any angel from heaven preach, he says to the Galatians, if any angel from heaven preach to you a different doctrine, do not, they are anathema. Do not believe in them. If they preach anything different than what you already received, they is, those are false teachers. Do not believe them. Do not believe them. And of course, we have seen through church history false teachers who denied uh, Jesus' incarnation, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, and they thought a gospel without those foundational doctrines. We recognize false teachers by their doctrine, their lives, by not sticking to the gospel of Christ. Now, But as, just going back to this illustration, I think what Paul is doing here is very helpful for us because he's bringing about the illustration, an example of what something happens in the Old Testament for us to understand what's going on, what was going on in his own time, and it's valid for us today. Just going back to uh, what happened with Moses and Janus and Jembers. As the Moses, he performed a sign and he through his staff, it became a serpent. Just keep in mind that his sign it was directed by God. And as these false, these magicians, sorcerers, they replicate that sign. Moses, uh, uh, as Moses' serpent swallow up uh, their serpents or their staff, it was clearly shown that regardless of how Satan raised up his magicians, his entertainers, his false teachers, they will never be able to stand before God's anointed people or God's anointed messenger or those who preach the gospel. They may replicate, but they, not, they cannot overcome those who 
preach the gospel. They cannot overcome the truth. They cannot overcome the church of Christ. As long as we are faithful and obedient to God's command, the darkness will not overcome God's people. They can do their trickery. They can say whatever they say. It may seem at the moment they may have the upper hand and they're winning. But just be reminded that no one can overcome the gospel of Christ. What God has finished on the cross is for us. He died for our sins. He was resurrected for our justification. And he now stands in victory in heaven. No one can overcome that. Not even death. He swallowed up death by resurrecting from the dead. And as the trickery acts of Janus and Jambres expose uh, their foolishness, and they had to recognize before Pharaoh that Moses and Aaron were sent by God, and what they did was by divine power. So will be all the trickery and lies of false teachers. It will all be exposed. Their folly will be playing to all. Nothing will be hidden. It will all be exposed. But the sad truth, the sad truth is that false teachers will continue to appear and draw many after them until the coming of Christ. Matthew 24. Many will be led astray. They will continue to appear more and more and more. I'm not sure some of you maybe remember this. Have you heard about the name David Koresh? David Koresh, he was the man who led this insurrection in the 1991-1993, I'm not sure the the, the year exactly, in Waco, Texas. And he called called himself the Messiah. And, And he built a compound in Texas. And he founded this cult that he was the Messiah. And, and the cult was calling a, called the Davidian branch. And so, there's something else in that. So he drew many people to this compound, and they became his followers. And, and there's a part of the, his documentary about him where he's telling to the reporter, saying, people sometimes they just get amazed at how much I know the Bible, how I know so much about the Psalms. And this, his followers, they believed that he was the Messiah. In the end, 80 people died with him because they refused to leave the compound after he caught in flames. They refused to live because he, they, he was saying to them, if they died with him, they would get into heaven. So in an interrogation with the police officers, actually he got uh, shot. So 80 people died willingly, believing that he was the Messiah. 28 children died with those, among the 80 people, eight, 28 children died. And some of you remember because the standoff was like like over 50 days. And so the point is false teachers, people claiming to be the Christ who continue to appear. And he was not the first one. He was not the first one. The guy before him in South Africa who many people died to drink poison and, and so on. And throughout history, many appeared and many will continue to appear and they will claim, I am the light, I have the truth, fall after me. But in fact, they're only preying on people. David Koresh, they were preying on teenagers among the women living in his compound. And he even said to some of the women and to, to the couples, you, for, for, for the husbands, not to, have, not to get together with their wives anymore because now he is the kind of uh, husband to all of them. So you see, they're only preying on people. But they draw people away. They draw people after them because of their knowledge. And he's like David Koresh, just boasting. People just get amazed that I know so much about the Bible. So we must be careful, friends, to whom we lend our ears to listen to. There are many false teachers in our days. And we must stay away from false, false, falsehood. As believers... We are not, we are not immune 
to falsehood. We are not immune to the false gospel. We are not. We have been given faith to believe in the true gospel. And the Lord promised to lead and protect his sheep from the wolves. But to know the gospel does not make us immune to falsehood. That's why it's so important to be part of a healthy church. To be part of a community that will encourage you. That will help you to stay on the right track. To listen to faithful Bible preachers. That our faith may continue to grow. May continue to increase in knowing God. And brothers and sisters help us in this walk. We must stay away from falsehood. We, must, we need to be careful of men and women who are active online, who have active uh, platforms online. There are many who say that they are Christians, conservatives, uh, who claim that they are reform in their theology, who know so much about this, so much about that, so much about his, uh, uh, church history. They call themselves defenders of truth. But in reality, they are only seeking more followers. They are only seeking people to give the thumbs up and more and more followers that generate money. That generate money. <coughs> so people will, will find a good niche and they will just prey on that. And they will say whatever people want to hear. That gives them money and prestige. By leading their, lending their ears to some, many were influenced by the views and opinions of ungenerate people. That happened in Paul's day, and it still happened in our days. Ungenerate people. Ungenerate people out there claiming to be Christians. Conservative in their views. We're all for family. We must be careful whom we are listening to. Perhaps you have heard this expression, I'm sure you heard. You are what you eat, right? People love to say that, especially those who are very into eating healthy, which um, I'm trying to, as long as you allow me to eat once a week, Chick-fil-A. <laughs> so you are what you eat. But what we see in the scriptures is that what we hear also shapes who we are. What we hear shapes who we are. Let me just give an example, and I will give you a passage that makes this point. A person who has been trained in classical music will have a hard time listening to Taylor Swift and the like. And a person who has been trained in Taylor Swift and the like will be have a hard time in listening to classical music. Because that shapes our taste for music. And I would even go a little bit further saying it shapes our word bill. Because they stand for something most of, especially uh, musicians our, in our days. Well, let's think about the scriptures. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. What it says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing the word of Christ. What we hear shape who we are. We must be very vigilant and careful what we are listening to. And actually, my question is for you. Whom do you listen to in this age of podcasts and YouTube and, 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 and Internet? Whom do you listen to? It's an important question. Because if Romans 10, 10, 10, chapter 10, verse 17, it's true that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. Are you listening? Are you giving more of your time to listen to God's word or to listen to the opinions and word views of other people? Very, very important. It will shape who you are. By the way, I'm, I have nothing in, in, against Taylor Swift, but nothing in favor, so <laughs> without offense, so those who listen to. Um, I mean, in fact, we have seen some weird things coming from her, but that's a conversation for other time. So maybe I do have something against, not specific for her, but some of music. That she's playing. Um, just another thing, and I'm going to jump to my second point. What is interesting is that false teachers, they display a, a measure of godliness on the outside, a measure of altruism. Like they're all, they're, they have this message, I am for other people. Right? I'm, I'm living for other people, for the good of others. 
they have this, 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 this package on the outside that can easily deceive others. While on the inside, they're ravenous wolves, just seeking an opportunity, just, just observing where they are and find how can they actually creep into households. What, where are these women burdened with sin? Where are these men who are easily led astray by false teachings? They look to these people. They come into the midst of, of the sheep just to pray. Where are the sick sheep or the most vulnerable sheep or the sheep is who, who is a little further from the, from the fold? And if they are a little further, it's just a matter of bringing them further and further until they can actually prey on that sheep and then come back for more. They're very strategic. So we must be careful with that. Another issue is not the, the, the deceivers and false teachers. They do not love. They do love, but their love was direct towards themselves in pleasure rather than God and others. So like Paul, we live in an age of lovers. And this is my second point. Like Paul, we live in, a, in, in an age of lovers. And this, uh, this point will be shorter. Now, if you observe the list of vices from, verse, from verses 2 and 5, in this list, it starts and ends talking about love. Look at verse 2. For people will be lovers of self. And in verse 4, uh, verse 5, uh, verse 4, I'm sorry. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So the list of vices starts and ends with love. So we could rightly say that without true love that comes from God and it is for God, people will inevitably have a distorted view, a distorted form of love. Everybody loves something or someone, but not everybody loves what we are created to love, God. The love of money, the love of self, pleasure are all intimately linked Ours is the age of selfies and social media, the internet, globalization, and fast Wi-Fi. The cry of our time is to love yourself first and pursue the things that makes you happy. They say, our culture say, says, humans were made to be happy and free. Therefore, pursue your happiness. Don't worry too much about others. Think about you. The logic here is that to love rightly is to love yourself first. And this kind of statement that places self in the center of our existence is dangerous. And reveals how secularism and liberalism are the leaders of the marching band in our days. They are dictating how society speaks, lives, and interacts with each other. The love of self, money, and pleasure has already made our society short-sighted, increasingly individualized, and distant from God and each other more and more. I like what John Chrysostom in 4th century, one of the church fathers, he says this, and I quote, He that loves himself may be said not to love himself, but he that loves his brother loves himself in the truest sense. And he's reflecting on this verse, he's reflecting on this passage in regards of self, uh, the love of self. As it was in Paul's time, we can hear the whispers of the old serpent in our time. And the old serpent, Satan, will go on to say, is not God good and kind? So, why would he hinder his creation from being happy? And the serpent goes on to say, Indulge yourself in pleasures. Use your money to buy what you want and spend it on yourself. Life is about here and now. Live it fully. Be happy and have fun. Don't allow anyone to tell you otherwise. Love yourself and see how the cosmos, the universe, will work for you. Everything will conspire for your good and your help 
in, in your happiness. <laughs> now, my friends, that's Satan's voice. That's the old serpent that comes with his smooth talk to deceive you and to draw you to the world, to lawlessness, to reject God and his good creation. No. We want to be happy, and God created us to be happy and joyful. And we should be grieved to see so much suffering, pain, destruction, and death in our times. But we must be reminded all these things are the result of our rebellion towards God, not God's sadistic character who likes to make us, who, who, who have great pleasure in seeing us suffering. That's not who God is. God is love. And He created us to love Him first. And in loving Him first, we love rightly. And by loving Him rightly, we can then love others rightly. Like what another author said, God is love. And we can only love and live rightly by loving God first, which I already said. But here's the point. Because the world loves God wrongly, all kinds of sins had followed. All kinds of vices had followed from this, from this wrong object of love. Instead of loving God first, our word tells us to love ourselves and everything else first, and then all kinds of vices and sin had followed, and we are seeing this increase of godlessness as people plunge into more and more the love of self. In thinking about this list of vices, John Chrysostom, he makes a, a, a very interesting connection with all these vices, and this is what he says, and I quote, from self-love springs covetousness. From covetousness springs boastfulness. From boastfulness, pride. From pride, blasphemy. From blasphemy, defiance and disobedience. End quote. The self-absorbed person is ungrateful. He only attributes his successes to himself and not to his creator or to the help of others. Unholy means to be enemies of the fundamental decencies of life. Unforgiving, incapable of being reconciled to another human being. Slanderous, without self-control, brutal, traitors. This is the same Greek word used to describe Judas. Traitors, ruthless. It stops at nothing to gain their ends. Swollen with conceive, all these sins it springs from the self of love. And what does our society tell us? Love yourself first. Pursue your happiness. Be happy. Be happy. That's what you're created to be. Be happy. And everything had fallen. And will continue to fall. And will continue to grow in godliness until Christ returns. The self is the original cause of all weakness, wickedness, wickedness, wickedness. <laughs> it's another commentator who said this. So the point here is I, I'm not trying to crush your hope for a better world, even though that's not going to happen here <laughs> in this earth unless Christ returns. The point of this text is to help us to put our hope in something greater. Amen. The point of this text is to help us to help us to put instead of having our, our eyes towards what's going on around us, towards heaven, where Christ is seated on the throne in glory. Amen. He's helping us to see that the love of God is the most important pursuing our lives. I like the reader, uh, writer A.W. Tozer, 
and I know this, he, he can be a little controversial, but in his book of Pursuit of God, he makes this point that we were created to seek God's face daily. To seek. Not just to, and, and when he talks about seek, he, seek, he develops this idea in his book, but the point is, make this your goal to seek God first in your life and love him rightly. Not just to love him, but to love him rightly. And how do we love him rightly? By obeying his commandments. By obeying his commandments. By loving Jesus. Pursuing him with everything we have. Now this text gives us a, a, a exact description of our society. Which helps us to have a realistic, biblical worldview. Instead of a humanistic worldview that is centered on men, but one that is centered on God. And that's what we need, my friend. If you want to, to live with hope in this world, even though we see this increase of godlessness and, 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 and what Paul is saying, that it will continue to increase. This text is also a great reminder that like the church in Ephesus, we also live in the last days. I don't want you to live this morning sad thing they always lost. And that what is left to us is just to throw in the towel and cry it out. Hide in our bunkers, eat all our dry food, and, and watch something, watch those cassette uh, videos of the, time, of the past time. No, that's, the point is not to get into the bunker, not to hide under the seat or under the pews. But the point is that we continue to live as lights in the world. As God said to his people in Matthew chapter 4. The point is that we continue to live being faithful to God even though we see the society growing in lawlessness. Remember, remember, when Christ was crucified, his disciples' hopes, hope was crushed. They believed that Jesus would restore the Davidic kingdom. And they were right. But they saw things from an earthly standpoint. When Jesus died, what's going to happen now? Some of them went back to their old jobs, to their old lives. But after Jesus' resurrection, when they saw the resurrection, the resurrected Christ and his ascension, they understood that Jesus' mission was to restore the Davidic kingdom in the present age. And to bring about a new king that is yet to be revealed. They understood that Jesus was talking about a new kingdom. But not in the sense of an earthly kingdom and a military power. But a kingdom with much, much more glory. So again, we should grieve for seeing the world grow into more and more in godliness. And far and far away from God. But that should not lead us into despair. Or cause us to be overly concerned for our safety or for the safety of our children. And I know how, how that can be a, a deep, uh, a, a huge concern and burden over, over the parents. As they think about the world. And think about our children and their future. But if you're concerned about your children, let's make sure that we're teaching them the gospel. Amen. Let's make sure that we are taking care. We should save, make some provisions for the future. Let's make sure that we are preaching the gospel to our children. Because things will not get better in this world. Not yet. The gospel is our victory. We're just saying that. Show us Christ. The gospel is our victory. Show us Christ. The gospel is our victory over deception and godlessness. Even though it may not seem so. Even though we don't see it with our physical eyes. But it is. Christ was resurrected. More than 500 people saw him after he was resurrected. It's not just a, a fable of Christians. This is what we believe. This is the reason for our hope. This, this is everything. We don't have the resurrected Christ. We just have a good teacher, a good prophet. But no, we have a God in flesh. His incarnation was real. He was God in flesh. He never sinned. And he died for our sins on that cross. He was resurrected for our justification. So that all who believe in Christ will be saved. All of those who repented of their sins will be saved. We lived 
in their light. That we'll join him in glory forever. John chapter 16, verse 33, he, record, he records Jesus saying this, In me you have peace. In the world you have tribulation. But I take heart. I overcome the world. By the way, friends, in an age of lovers, we are, all, we are also lovers. Make sure that you love, that your love is directed towards, not towards yourself, but towards the one who conquered the world. To love Jesus means to carefully listen to his word and live by faith. 